So, so now we'll begin. Dr. Ting, thank you very much for joining me on the Jaw Hacks channel today to do an interview pertaining to the MSE. So I will um, briefly introduce you, Dr. Ting, and by all means, if I miss any important details or if there's anything else you'd like the audience to know, please fill in. So we have here today Dr. Richard Ting, uh, who graduated from USC Dental School in 1991, who did an orthodontics residency in 2001 at NYU, and who now uh, owns and operates Ting Orthodontics, Airway and Functional Orthodontics in Rancho Santa Margarita, California, which is in Orange County, California, smack dab between San Diego and LA. So it's about an hour in change from downtown San Diego and about an hour in change from downtown LA. And of course, Dr. Ting is uh, one of the MSE uh, guys, uh, gurus. He's done close to 300 MSE cases. And so today we want to pick his brain about the MSE, which is the maxillary skeletal expander. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Dr. Ting. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, we're happy to have you and we appreciate your time. My pleasure. So Dr. Ting, is there anything else you'd like to add about it? How, how many MSE cases um, do you have at this point? Right now, we have a little bit over 300 cases, actually. Just okay. this month alone, we have about 30 cases in August going in. So we're probably going to hit the 350 pretty quickly in about two months. So are you seeing more and more cases, uh, more and more patients who want the MSE appliance? Yes, actually, we have patient come for a consultation just to request the MSE device. And of course, you can't just have the MSC device put in without a comprehensive orthodontic treatment because all the jaw, everything will change, okay? So usually, you, the patient will follow through with a comprehensive orthodontic treatment. It's either with the braces or the Invisalign or a hybrid of both. Right, and so is there anyone in the world who has more MSE cases than you at this point? As far as I know, no. Now, Dr. Wang Moon is the inventor. I'm not sure how many cases he's done by himself. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he used to talk at UCLA. I'm not sure if he's still at UCLA. And uh, um, the student will do some MSE cases. So personally, I put on my number in the MSE user group. So far, nobody challenged the number that more than mine. Okay. So actually, uh, on a side note, I did have uh, someone who I spoke with through my website tell me they were in touch with um, UCLA, and they told uh, that person that Dr. Juan Moon was no longer at UCLA. So oh, I see. I, see. I don't know what's going on with that, but um, yeah. you know, it's a lot we, of issue going on in UCLA. So uh, uh, you know, it's not got to do with how good of an orthodontist, how good of a teacher you are. Um, Dr. Moon is an excellent, excellent teacher and genius orthodontics. And um, if he departs from UCLA, it's definitely not because of ability or anything else. Okay, I can vouch for that. I know him personally. He's an excellent, excellent orthodontist. Yeah, no doubt. And we're all grateful to him for uh, inventing the the MSE uh, Type One and Type Two device, which I I wore the MSE Type Two for eleven months and achieved. Uh, a lot of expansion with it. So um, cheers, to, cheers to Dr. Moon yes. for his contribution to orthodontics. Now, on the side note that personally, I think MSC is one of the greatest invention in the reason orthodontic history. Okay. MSC wow. uh, with the TAB in combination, probably it's the game changer um, that haven't happened for the past hundred years in orthodontics. It's the first time, <clears throat> first time in the history will be able to change structure and function of the oral maxillofacial structure. So we're not just straightening teeth anymore. We can actually change and correct the structure and function of the face. That's remarkable. And just for the viewers, you mentioned MSE plus TADs. I want to make sure that, um, that the audience knows what you mean when you say that. We're talking about separate things. 
Now, TED was invented quite a while ago, probably 15, about 15 years ago, okay? So MSC is probably, I think, around five, six years ago invented. Both of them combined together changed the face of the Orlando. Sure, and can you just explain briefly, I think we know roughly what the MSE is. The MSE, of course, is a bone anchored uh, lateral palatal expander that splits the maxilla and allows you to achieve uh, an increased um, lateral dimension to the maxilla. Uh, we're all familiar with that, but what are TADs and how, and how do they, briefly, how do they relate to the MSE in an orthodontic treatment plan? No. MSC is anchored actually by four TADs. TADs, the full name will be temporary anchorage device. It's actually basically some mini titanium screw, something made out of stainless steel, something made out of titanium. And they use a little, little tiny screw, uses a bone anchor. Okay. So basically when you insert it in the bone, you can use that as an anchor to pull and push or push to any direction you want to, if it's possible. I see. So so the TADs, the TADs, often called TADs, are used in conjunction with the MSE. So of course, yes. they're part of the MSE because the MSE. MSE is screwed in with TADs, but then additional TADs might be used in conjunction with the MSE to accomplish other orthodontic uh, movements. Yes, that's correct. I see. I see. Thank you. And you're a, uh, my orthodontist, Dr. Zubad Nuwaz. And by the way, the audience should know that You've worked with Dr. Nuaz, my orthodontist, on my case. So you are a consultant. Uh, well, you've, you've provided a consultation on my case. Um, you're not too actively involved in my case, but uh, you've worked briefly with Dr. Nuaz on my case. And Dr. Nuaz refers to you as a, um, a big uh, expert of using TADS, not just the MSE, but also TADS. So um, you, you know, you're also... Uh, and an expert in that uh, orthodontic tool as well. Thank you. Yes, indeed. So, so Dr. Ting, I'm going to just jump into some basic questions. Tell us, how can a person know if they are a candidate for the MSE? What are the uses and indications for the MSE? Now, MSE is basically for structure correction. Okay. Now, structure correction means if your upper jaw, the bone structure is actually narrower than the lower jaw, then you are a candidate for the MSC. No matter what tooth direction do you bite, no matter how you're biting on it, because you have a structure issue. Now, the nice side effect of the structure correction is once you expand your jaw structure on the upper jaw, you expand the maxilla, you automatically, simultaneously expand your nasal cavity. So your nasal volume will increase. Okay. So you can use MSC to correct various problems, for example, cross bite, okay, or grinding issue, clenching issue, and also airway issue will be improved with the MSC. And also we can use MSC to control the vertical dimension. Some people have excessive long face, those who can control them pretty well. So MSC is a, it's a tool, not a single purpose tool that provided for the, for the practitioner. So it depends on the practitioner's experience how to explore the, the tool. It's like if you give you a power, power drill, you can do so many things with a power drill, but depends on what you know, how you deal with it. Okay. That's basically what the MSE is. Understood. And these um, deficiencies that the MSE can be used to help fix, so, uh, in, in what I do through my blog and through my YouTube channel, I constantly have people asking me whether or not they're candidates for the MSC. Oftentimes these people have functional issues that they're trying mm -hmm. to address, breathing, grinding, um, TMD. A lot of times though, um, patients just wanna change the way they look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so would you, and, and would you say, however, a lot of times these patients, they're more traditional orthodontist says, that's crazy. You don't need the MSE. Uh, you're not a candidate for something so invasive and um, excessive. Would you say though that what percentage of the general population could benefit from the type of expansion you get with the MSE? I think general minimally 60% population could benefit from MSE. And uh, as much as 80%, I believe in 
okay? There's a lot of gray area that I like to recommend MSC, but at the same time, I don't want to be called high performing excessive treatment. So I would say 60% would be a good number. Because as we know, if, if anyone watching this had been done research on this topic, that human jaw development had been stalling since the civilization because of our soft diet. We, we don't use teeth as a tool anymore. So our jaw failed to grow as much as what we call the early modern human. Okay. So with the narrow jaw com compounded with other issues, the narrow, the TMJ problem that come along with it, the, uh, the nasal cavity problem come with it, the lack of a wisdom two space problem also come with those small jaw development. Okay. So technically the majority population can can benefit from it. I think for a lay person point of view, without dental knowledge, the easiest way to compare is if you pull your cheek on the side and look at your, the upper, the gum area, the bone area, don't look at the tooth, because your tooth could be flare out compensating. Okay. Look at the supporting bone structure on top and supporting bone structure on the bottom. Once you pull your cheek to the side, if you see your upper bone is actually narrower than the bottom bones inside, or the bottom jawbone, then you do have a structure problem, okay? And technical term is you have your upper jawbone supposed to be slightly wider than the lower jawbone. That's a normal skeletal structure supposed to look like. So those are a, a common self-diagnosed tool you can use if you have good eyes to look at comparing to upper lower jawbone. Again, um, I specifically mentioned not comparing your teeth because a lot of patients with narrow upper jaw, they have compensating what we call the buckle flare on the molars. So their upper molar is actually tipping outwards and the lower molar have lingual compensation. That means they're actually tipping inwards. So you look at the bottom molars are tipping inward, upper molar tipping outward, then most likely you are having some structure problem. Therefore your teeth are compensating each other. Right, right. And um, this distinction between uh, the angulation of the teeth and the underlying bone structure is a very important one. Because we, when we started this discussion, you talked about how the MSE is a game changer in orthodontics because it allows us to change the underlying structure. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, and this is a very common question that I get, is if we're only expanding the maxilla with the MSE, then how do we prevent a situation in which the upper teeth become wider than the lower teeth? And I think this might have to do with teeth angulation again. So I wanted to bring that up now. That's a really good point. I think majority of the population had this kind of question. Okay. Now remember, because we're growing into a smaller upper jaw structure, so I would say a good 99% of those patients will have compensating buckle tipping, flaring of the molars, and lingual tipping of the mandibles, lingual uh, mandibular teeth. So the correction is easily, if even you don't have crossbite. Again, crossbite means your, your upper teeth are biting inside the lower teeth. Even if you don't have those crossbite, by simply tipping those upper molars inward and uprising those bottom molars, then you gain the difference to expand at least a minimum six millimeter. Okay. Now, between four to six from just compensating are actually pretty reasonable number. Okay. So you can gain about four to six millimeter of expansion that you can get. Now, majority of my patient actually the expansion I give it to them is between four to eight millimeters. It's a very common between four to eight. I'll say four to six actually even more common because in reality, you don't need that much of expansion to achieve your goal of structure correction. Okay. A lot of time you see it, um, a patient with a huge space in the middle and it's really not that necessary in my opinion. From, from my experience, even if a patient have a two millimeter gap happen between the front teeth, 
patient already feels significant changes in their airway uh, spaces. They can breathe much easier. Most of my patient, a vast majority of patient with a four millimeter uh, gap in the middle can tell me their airway problem has gone away, okay? They usually give me a scale between one to 10, they would need an A or a nine for the four millimeter. Now, if you get six to eight millimeter expansion, then you pretty much have no airway restrictions anymore. If you have any other airway issue, it will be from other area of the, body, the, 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 uh, the head and neck. That's remarkable, that's remarkable. And I can comment that when I did my MSE, and I uh, very early in the expansion process, probably at about uh, 30 turns, maybe 35 turns in my 12 millimeter MSE, I noticed a, a complete change in my nasal airway as you described. So I think that probably yeah. would have been maybe two or three millimeters of expansion uh -huh. very every early in the process. Turns one millimeter. One more time? Every, every six turns is one millimeter. Okay. Yes. Okay. So sure. So I was, you know, well, I guess maybe more than I thought, maybe a few yeah. millimeters in, and I felt a remarkable change in my airway. Yes. Um, Definitely. You probably only get about two, possibly, because you're adult, okay? You're adult male, so your, your, um, the TAD, the four TAD anchor on your maxilla may have tipped maybe around two millimeter already, okay, during those expansion. So you probably, after 30 turns, technically you expand about six, um, five millimeter, but you're actually only getting about two. I see. And where do the, where do all those other turns go? Where is that force transferred to? Tipping, because when you when you're forcing them, especially if you use the fast turning technique, there's even more more tipping. So when when you expand the screw the the jack screw in the middle, put pressure on those TADs. Now those TAD will naturally start tipping sideways. Okay. Now those tipping sideways routinely goes. You will lose about minimally one to about two to three millimeter. I see really drastic tip of, the, of those, then you lose a good four to six millimeter total in, in the uh, expansion space. So for male, we usually routinely have more of a tipping issue on the TAD. So I would assume after 30 turns, usually the tipping happened initially. So you probably only get about two millimeter. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. if you experience significantly airway difference that proved my point that even if you have two millimeter changes, you feel significant change in the airway. Yeah, no, I think that that, that point is certainly reflected in my experience. Actually, in my, um, in my MSC split video, I think I, which is the video I recorded to, to announce, oh my gosh, my suture split, look at this gap that formed. In that video, I noticed that I was already feeling uh, more open nasal breathing. So the nasal breathing improves very early on in the process. And while we're on this subject, someone commented on Facebook the other day, um, what percentage of MSC patients experience an improvement in nasal breathing? And my response to it was, I think it's physically impossible if there is a successful split to not have an improvement in nasal breathing would you would you disagree with that? I would agree. I, I would totally agree with that. Okay. Now, in my my interviewing with the patient, if it's a adult patient, okay, 90 percent of the time they will say yes, a lot of improvement. There will be ten percent say yeah, there's some minor improvement, but it's definitely improvement. I don't have anyone say no improvement except teenagers or kids. But bear in mind, a lot of teenagers and kids, whatever they ask them, they will tell you, that, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's their routine answer to yeah. any adult is, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Um, there's a little, <laughs> little disconnect between teenager and adult. I think that's what yeah. they do. But if you ask a responsible adult, they usually give you a pretty definite answer. Or definitely there is improvement. Right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Dr. Ting, I want to circle back to something you said, and you said that basically you could start a patient 
who had fairly coordinated upper and lower, meaning the upper teeth and the lower teeth were matched, regardless of tipping of the teeth, right? And you could take a person who was pretty even and you could expand them four to eight millimeters and then have to do no surgical intervention on the lower. You could correct, you could match the, the expansion of the upper with the lower simply by tipping teeth. And so, so what that means is that even for a patient who starts out even, their teeth even, their teeth coordinated, not in a crossbite, visually at least, a person like that is still a candidate for the MSE. A person like that is still a candidate to expand the, the maxilla with this device. Exactly, exactly. Like I say, all you need is between two to four millimeter expansion, you will Im improve your uh, air quality significantly. Okay. okay. Now, I always give a patient a comparison. I think we all try before would try to breathe through a little cocktail straw. It's a common thing that when you sip on the cocktail with a straw and then you felt, mm, you know what, I can breathe through a little bit. It's difficult to breathe through a little one piece of cocktail straw. But if you have two or three cocktail straws together and you try to breathe through it, it's actually breathable. Okay, so that proves a little bit increase of the volume of your nasal cavity would drastically improve the breathable quality in your airway. I see, because a cocktail straw, of course, is a very thin type of straw, kind of like mm -hmm. the kind you might have to mix your coffee or something. Yeah. And just doubling a very, a very narrow cylinder, just doubling or tripling a very narrow space can have a dramatic change in your experience of airway. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great image. And I think that yeah, anyone could try that right now. They could go to Dunkin' Donuts and grab a few of those brown <laughs> straws. Um, Support and, a small business. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> not at this. This uh, this interview is not being sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dr. Ting, you've emphasized a lot about improvement in airway with MSC, and I think that I think that it's, it's very easy to understand how splitting the suture opens up the nose. It's clear. It's physically impossible not to open the nose if you split the suture, I think you could say. Exactly. It's physically impossible to not to increase the nasal volume with the, with the true skeletal expansion of the palate. It's physically impossible. Right. Now, t tell us, Dr. Ting, what about aesthetic changes um, Aesthetic changes, okay. Majority of patient does have any feedback on the aesthetic changes. Okay. However, in some adult patients, especially the ladies, they will say, hey, I feel like my mid face got enhanced a little bit. I feel like my cheekbone get a little bit enhanced. Now, bear in mind that at the beginning of the expansion, you will naturally get some minor inflammation around the area, very subtle inflammation. Usually the patient can't even tell the difference. But when the subtle goes away, you will see the bone changes. <clears throat> now again, the reason why we put a, a, a MSC expander in is because the patient had deficient maxilla. So any deficient maxilla, when you add to the volume, it's always a welcoming fact aesthetically. So I do have I would say probably 10%, 10, 20% adult saying the mid face get more enhanced. And I never have any patient complain about it. Okay. I do have one kid. I think the kid's up, it's about 10 years old. He's in between phase one treatment and phase two treatment. But he has such a bad airway problem that parents want to get him treated for airway. Uh, as long as the kid, kid, the suture is ready to open right away. So we put the expander in. We only did 20 turns. <clears throat> 20 turn means time divided by six, that means about three millimeter expansion. It's a pure three millimeter expansion. Uh, we call a patient back three weeks later, patient come in. Patients say they have significant improvement in the airway. Parents say he sleep way better. So I tell the, tell the mom, Great, let's do another 20 turn. 
a mom turned to me and say, can we not do those 20 turns? <laughs> because I don't like the cheek to come out too much. Okay. And his breathing already corrected. So I want to keep it that way. My reaction is, okay, great, excellent. Then let's keep it that way. Okay, well, until the, the suture filled in and everything. And just merely 20 turns, um, mom felt it different and changed. Again, you know what? I, I explained to mom, don't worry about the face change at this time because most likely it's inflammation. <clears throat> okay. Right, right. By inflammation. But once it goes away, we can revisit the topic, but I'm so glad the airway is being improved. Right, right. Well, I think that that case just goes to show that the MSE does have a significant change on the mid face. Um, like you said, maybe in, in that boy's case, there was a lot of inflammation still from the splitting process and the installation and whatnot. But um, certainly in my own case, uh, others have commented that there was some change in this part of my face. Uh, have you ever seen um, a case where there has been too much change in this part of the face to the point where the upper bone becomes too wide for the lower jaw following MSE treatment, resulting in a kind of top heavy aesthetic? Or do you, do you, are you very careful about not over expanding? What do you have to say about over expansion? No, my expansion guideline is I expand it until I see the upper bone it's more out than the lower bone. That's when I stop. Okay. That's when I start talking the molars, correcting, demonstrating everything else. Where do you see that on a CBCT? No, you can actually just look in person. You can just peel the cheek back like peel you described back, earlier. Yes, and then take a look, the bone upper and lower compare what we call the basal bone. Okay. Right. See the upper bone is outside the lower bone and see how much torque angulation you, you kind of guesstimate how much you can torque up the more upper um, the uh, bottom molar, how much you can torque in the ma um, maxillary molar, then you do your judgment. Now, I always tell patient, <clears throat> this is not the end of the turns. We might have to turn more later, okay? Because a lot of times, especially on younger kids or teenager, when you think everything is done, the lower jaw start getting wider and wider and wider. Then we end up start cranking again three months down the road, four months down the road. I have a patient that MSC stayed there six months, we're ready to take it out. And I look at it again, wait a minute, lower jaw, either the molar upright quite a lot, just by simply pulling the braces, <clears throat> or the jaw bone, like jaw actually grow. It, now, what, at what age are we talking here that this is possible that the lower jaw grows like that still? No, for. For boys, you can, the lower jaw grow all the way from 13, 14 years old, all the way to 18, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Girls, basically probably 10 and a half to 14, that's the limit. Hmm. Hmm. Now, a lot of times the jaw width, the width-wise, a lot of people worry about the width of the lower jaw. Now, they actually, what they should worry about is how the anterior posterior position, how forward the lower jaw is. Because if you push the lower jaw inward, just imagine if you push the lower jaw inward, then your narrow part of the lower jaw is facing the wider part upper jaw. Of course, your lower jaw is going to be looking small. But if your lower jaw can be extended forward, okay, then you're using the wider part upper jaw against the proper wider part lower jaw. Oh, that's very a interesting. Lot, so a lot, of lower, a lot of people look in the lower jaw, they're looking at the wrong direction because the lower jaw is more receded, so look like it's more narrow. It's not the width, it's the forward backward position. Right. Once you move the lower jaw to the proper forward position, then those narrowness naturally goes away because jaw is a, it's a triangle horseshoe, right? This part, it's wider, this part narrower. So if you move the lower jaw forward, then the wider part appear with a, <clears throat> um, a bite with the upper jaw. That's when you know it's an equalized or not. Now, on teenager, there's a lot of tricks. Let's, let's, then we talk about how to correct the job position. <clears throat> on the grown teenager or kids, much easier. We can simply enhance the growth by pushing lower jaw growth. And that will solve a lot of problems. Okay, tell us what that means, please. No. 
if the kid's growing, then we use various different kind of device uh, or appliance. For example, there's a herbs appliance that stretch low jaw to go forward on growing kids, as well as Invisalign with a mandibular advancement. It's an Invisalign with the four little wings attached to the back that force the kid to bite forward. Therefore, the condy will grow with it, okay, if the patient is growing. Now, an adult, when the patient is not growing, that's not possible. So that will be played by either surgery or the rotation of lower jaw, okay? For example, if the patient, so that's another topic we're talking about. If the patient has excessive facial height, like a long stretch face, for those kind of patients, we simply by intruding the whole upper jaw, the lower jaw will close more forward. So you get a shorter face, lower jaw swing forward, that kind of resolving the little overjet issue. Now you said intruding the whole upper jaw. Tell us briefly what that means. Now the whole upper teeth actually we're gonna push upward into the maxilla a little bit more. And how would you do that? Using TADS? Yes, combination of TADS and also the pre-existing MSC that we have. The, the test on the MSC. We use that connect with some elastics and then we can push the whole arch forward. Or we can just simply push the back section, the molar section of the teeth and close down the facial dimension. Once you close down the lower jaw will automatically swing forward and that will resolve the problem. Right, right. So let me just demonstrate for the audience what you mean by that. So you're saying that we correct lower jaw position by intruding the upper teeth, by sucking them up into the bone, you could say, mm -hmm. and that gives the lower jaw an opportunity to come more counterclockwise, you could say. Yes. So, and you said that intruding the upper teeth was accomplished using tads and elastics. Uh, so let me just, I, I have a little bit of that in my mouth, so I can just demonstrate what that looks like. So... If you see here, I have a tad. This is a, a little titanium screw or stainless steel screw screwed into the bone of my arch. And then I have a power chain attached to these two teeth. That's, and this results in this tooth and this tooth being pulled up into the bone or being intruded into the bone. So you would do this type of setup for any teeth that you wanted to intrude. Yes. Yes. Now, interesting, intrusion doesn't have to be dramatic because comparison is when you get <clears throat> one, one, one portion of intrusion, you get four portion in the front. Okay. So all you do is just merely intrude maybe one millimeter. The front, you see a dramatic reduction in the facial height and the lower jaw swing forward. Wow. So those how we manipulate play with it. Now, unfortunately, and also at the same time, <clears throat> a lot of patients with the excessive facial height, it's because the upper, upper uh, the, the palate is so narrow, the maxilla is so narrow, so the molar is that, upper molar is actually compensating tipping outward. That tipping outward movement kind of yank your jaw open up more. So by simply widening them and then tip those upper molar inward, Okay, we let the teeth settle into what we call the maximum intercuspation instead of biting in the wrong spot and biting into. Can you yes. lift your hands up because you're they're a little bit out of the yes. frame? We'll be the teeth will be sucking into each other properly called maximum intercuspation. By creating a maximum intercuspation, we'll naturally reduce about half, maybe even one millimeter of the uh, the back of the height, and then the front will reduce a drastic change that's remarkable and all of this that's of course, another part of the msc correction problem. right this is this is made possible by the mse because to yes. do this you need to first widen the underlying structure yes now remember to talk about controlling facial height with the msc msc one of the characteristic controlling facial height the conventional expander that attach the molars when you expand that pushing the molar the molar will naturally tip out this way so once you expand and tip out your facial height actually increase. Okay. Right. With and this type of expander. Yes, it will tip your molar out. 
the it more pushes on the teeth and it flares. I, this happened to me, so yeah. I can concur that this is true. Okay, so actually increase your facial height. MSC doesn't have those problems because the experienced MSC practitioner will cut out the arms of the MSC. So any effect of tipping molar out will be minimized, okay? okay. So the molar actually, well, and after what we're tipping inward, so that would actually decrease your facial height. So fa the facial, the vertical, we call them VDO, ver vertical dimensional occlusion control in MSC is super excellent. But again, MSC is a tool. If your practitioner does not know how to use those advantage, then you can take full advantage of that. That's of course. Powerful. Of course, and, and this is why, you know, um, a lot of people look at MSC like it's, a, like it's a commodity, like you're going out and buying an iPhone 12, right? Uh, everywhere yeah. you go, an iPhone 12 is an iPhone 12, whether it's in Massachusetts or Hong Kong or London. But actually, the MSC is nothing like uh, a, consumer, a consumer product, right? It's, it's a tool like you describe. And the more important thing is who is the provider who's using this tool and and can that provider use it to its full potential as you're describing exactly, exactly. And, and this is why um i think it's so important that you've done 300 or roughly 300 mse cases i think that there's no replacement for experience with with this appliance or really with any medical intervention um or you know or even anything right you you know you want the mechanic who specializes in the bmw if you drive a bmw because he's done it a thousand times so um that that's a really interesting point and i also wanted to add a lot of times people ask me oh well should i do mse or should i go right into double jaw surgery and a big thing about double jaw surgery is that it gives you that counterclockwise rotation it addresses that facial length issue but this is, and this never occurred to me, but this is another reason why patients should start with MSE before getting into double jaw surgery, because uh, some of that counterclockwise rotation can be uh, accomplished with the MSE. Now, that's a very interesting thing to mention. I have oral surgeon, Dr. Stephen Vong, which I want to bring him to an interview with you in the near future. He's my, my go-to surgeon on the airway. In our common double jaw surgery patient, he always recommend MSC with it. Because according to him, just by simply doing the jaw split doesn't really give you a increase in airway as much as the MSC will provide, okay? So MSC actually provide the expansion because we didn't really cut the jaw loose like a two dentures, okay? Now the, Double jaw surgery, you actually cut the whole upper jaw loose. So it's kind of like a denture, you can remove it. Okay, now <clears throat> with the MSC, the heavy thing in, is intact. So when you expand, you naturally have to expand your nasal volume. So our double jaw surgery always precede with MSC to improve it. Now, one of the funny factors, a lot of patients come in diagnosed with all kinds of airway problems, you know, CPAP machine and this and that. My recommendation is MSE and then jaw surgery, either mandibular advancement or double jaw surgery. And after the MSE achieved the result in a month or two, a lot of them actually claim that, you know what, my airways problem's gone, okay? My, <clears throat> my snoring problem is drastically improved. I don't know if I need the jaw surgery. Okay, so jaw surgery become more of a aesthetic enhancement for some of them, okay. But I'm not denying the double jaw surgery usefulness because airway is four, basically four big components. One is your nasal volume. Second, it's a pharyngeal space. That's where people get tonsil removed. Three is the tongue volume. Number four, it's a combination of a tongue position and jaw position. If your jaw is more forward, your tongue is more forward. If your jaw is more backward, your tongue is more backward. Mm -hmm. Patient with tongue tie and, and so on. Those are the jaw, uh, tongue position. Now, when you do MSC, you correct three facts. Number one is you actually increase the nasal volume drastically. Number two, because of your whole palate 
they are widened, so is your pharyngeal space they are widened. Number three is the increase of tongue space. So out of three out of four, you got improvement on three out of four. Then those changes might be enough to make you within the normal range of the airway, proper airway uh, patient. Right, okay. right. So the number four factor becomes something luxury because people always have second thought when they're going to have surgery. Okay. Tell us about what, what you mean by number four. Number four is the job, lower job position. Right. Okay. So improve all of that is good enough. Now, for some hardcore patients, yes, we still do need to move both upper and lower job forward. And by hardcore, you mean extreme cases of really <laughs> severe mal, uh, poor development. Yes, extreme cases. But personally, I think MSC is one of the most important tool to try first before anything else. Right, right. So, so there's there's a let's say um, you know let's say 10, 10 patients present to you interested in double jaw surgery. Maybe with five or six or seven of these patients, you can say, "Hey, look, time out. Double jaw surgery. It's a lot to get into. It's very invasive. There's." a lot of potential side effects. Maybe what you should do is instead of jumping into double jaw surgery, we try the MSE first. You see how you feel after we expand. Then if you're not happy, if you still want more airway or more change in the aesthetic, then you can do double jaw yeah, surgery. Or you still have structure by issue, okay? That you have to get a lower jaw advancement to correct it. Right. Uh, so uh, tell us more about that issue. What do you mean by that? What, what is that issue like? Now, if the patient is really skeletal class two, for example, lower jaw is really, really inward. Or the patient is severely class three, that means the upper jaw is really, really push in. Okay. Those patients, even with the correction, you still have a lot of bite issue you need to correct. Okay. Then those patients are perfect for jaw surgery. I see. Yes, I see. I like jaw surgery. Most of my patients with severe skeletal discrepancy, I always prescribe jaw surgery. So they routinely go to the oral surgeon to get a pre-jaw surgery consultation and see if they're a candidate. I want them to mentally prepare. Okay. Yeah, of course. Because a lot of those cases still turn into jaw surgery cases. Yeah. It depends on how deficient, how, dis how much discrepancy you have. So you have a jaw surgeon that you have a relationship with that you work together with on many cases and you guys probably talk a couple times a week and you work together closely. And is this, a, is this an important thing for any orthodontist, especially an airway focused orthodontist to have a working relationship with a surgeon that they yeah. can... That's a must. That's a must. Um must have when you have a surgeon that you know what they're doing and they know what you're doing and they will trust your work and you'll trust their work and when they send into a surgery or surgical assist they know what they're getting into i have experience with some other surgeon mainly kaiser because <laughs> kaiser or surgeon they don't talk to anybody else they have no letter communication they have no phone call communications and they will say things against it, uh, the procedure. And I have a patient, we have a MSC put in, and a month later, come back on the MSC up because the jaw surgeon wanted to be out. Okay. And so you will get in those kind of frustrating issue if you have a surgeon that doesn't work with you, doesn't have the same goal, the same sharing of the knowledge. Now, my oral surgeon himself, he actually put in MSCs for other orthodontists. So, what, what's his name? Dr. Stephen Vaughn, is Stephen that right? Vaughn, v, uh, v A U G H A N, Stephen Vaughn. He's right. practicing in Full Hill Ranch, California. It's about 10 minutes away from my office, pretty close by. And um, he's a surgeon I see, seeing, I, you know, we, 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 we synchronize, we look at the same level. So when he called me and contacted me or text me, he just mentioned something, I know what he's talking about. I mentioned something, he know what I'm talking about. That's an important relationship to yeah. have with the surgeon. 
so you don't have miscommunication or work against each other and providing patient conflicting ideas so patient patient get confused. Mm-hmm. That's the last thing you want to do is have patient get confused. Now, confused from a person with experience, that's good. That's patient gain more knowledge. But many times you have doctor give you a conflicting idea where the doctor have no knowledge of that field. Then that's a problem. Yeah. For example, an oral surgeon come in on the MSC where he doesn't know anything about the MSC. Or another orthodontist come in about MSC, we haven't done a single case or never even attend any classes on MSC. Then those are just guessing. <laughs> yeah. Not really yeah. a valid opinion. A valid opinion is today I'm an MSC provider. And the patient went to another MSC provider who did 50 case, 100 case. Then his opinion definitely count. Right. That's a valid opinion. Or you go to an oral surgeon who did plenty of MSC and work with a surgical assistant MSC. Then that's a very valid opinion. Or the very surgeon is very concentrated on the improving airway matters. Then that's a valid opinion. Not someone who have no experience just talk, then those opinions really will hurt the patient. Not providing a help instead more damaging to patients seeking uh, proper help. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, ve- it's a very common thing that I see with people who talk to me is that they talk to too many different providers and too many different schools of thought. Okay, so when they talk to one type of provider, it's this and another type of provider, it's that. I think it's so important to find a team of airway focused dentists, doctors who understand the importance of appropriate expansion and then who also understand the tools that are available to accomplish that and then to just kind of invest and commit to an orthodontist and a surgeon, maybe a periodontist, um, maybe an ENT, uh, who, who, who all kind of see eye to eye on the same philosophy, this airway focused philosophy. Exactly. Um, but it, but it's, a, it's a minefield because actually there's a lot of airway focused dentists who don't like the MSE. You know, I'm specifically referring to the general dentists who do the, the AGA and the ALF and the DNA. The, the, these are almost never orthodontists, by the way. They're almost always <laughs> general dentists. And I don't want to you know, I don't want to go too down, too far down this kind of alley of discussing this, but a lot of times these, these folks, they're great at diagnosing airway issues. They're great at identifying them and telling a patient, oh, you need expansion, but they don't want to use the MSE for expansion, probably because they don't know anything about it and they're not skilled enough to use it. And they end up recommending the AGA, which as I've documented on my channel is essentially it's essentially a, a dangerous kind of almost, you could, you could say fraudulent appliance that's advertised as one thing, but in reality is something else entirely. It's advertised as something that's going to actually grow your maxilla. But the mm. reality is that it's just pushing. It's pushing on structures and it's causing root resorption, gum loss, alveolar bone loss. It's dangerous. So I talk to a lot of people who they know they need expansion but they say, really, should I do the MSE or should I do the AGA? And it's like, to me, it's a ridiculous question because one is um, a legitimate uh, orthodontist, orthodontist provided bone, bone borne expander. And then one is just, uh, you know, it's worse than snake oil. At least snake oil. <laughs> MSE research back up. <laughs> tell us about, um, tell us about your thoughts on these so-called growth appliances like like AGA, and I'm not, I'm not prying for gossip here, but yes. what would you say to a patient who was thinking, you know, Dr. Ting, I need more tongue space. I'm considering the AGA. Tell me why I should do your MSE appliance instead. Okay, so um, you bring up very, very interesting s- uh, and topics. And uh, it's, I don't wanna say controversial because there's nothing controversial about it. Um, First of all, um, my impression, I know that a lot of people are not going to be upset with me by saying this. First of all, 
I don't do Faga, Aga, DNA, or alpha primes. I, so I can't really comment how, how efficient those appliances are. And there's no orthodontist in the world I know, at least the orthodontist I know, ever trained on Faga, Aga, DNA, alpha appliances. And I don't know any school, orthodontic school, that teach you how to use Faga, Aga, DNA, and alpha appliance. They might be, but I don't know about. Will be very, very, very minority. So these appliances are directly marketed and taught to general dentists. Now, these are orthodontic movement appliances. They could like to call it growth appliance, whatever appliance. But the bottom line is they involve orthodontic movement. Now, if any product out there in the market doing those kind of orthodontic movement, the skip the whole the whole spectrum of orthodontic specialty and direct market directly to general dentists, then it kind of it's a red flag to me. Okay. If it's a legitimate product, for example, Invisalign, for example, MSC, they will first introduce to the orthodontics communities. That means that the orthodontists, the people who are expert on moving teeth to do those kind of stuff. Okay. And then there'll be research back up in the university and the orthodontic program, not some private research to legitimize those products, okay, those appliances, then they will be accepted in our community because our community is a very research-based community. Then, so when, when there's something out there, bypass all of us, directly market to general dentists who have a few hour training on ortho in dental school, uh, then it's pretty suspicious. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a red flag to me. Okay, imagine, imagine a, a pharmaceutical company come out with the medicine to, to cure heart disease, but they don't market to the cardiologist. They market to the dermatologist <laughs> or a general doctor. <laughs> right, right. That's how it's how ridiculous it sounds. That's how it is. But again, I never use it. So I can say if it's efficient or not efficient. Okay. I know people who use it are general dentists who attended those uh, continuing education classes and acquired those. No. Why would those general dentists refuse to use MSC? The bottom line is this. Some of them, not all of them, some ortho general dentists are very good at doing orthodontic uh, work. Some, um, uh, I'll say a large majority of them have no uh, well-trained uh, um, knowledge on how ortho orthodontic movement happens. So when there's something new happen, they can justify it's the right thing or is the wrong thing, okay? And the MSC was not marketed to general dentists. It's, 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 it's marketed directly to the orthodontics community. So they don't push out to general dentists. So general dentists doesn't have the knowledge of it and they know how to, they don't know how to identify if that's a good appliance or a bad appliance. So they don't want to use it. Instead, they use what they have paid, thousands of dollars in tuition, or tens of thousand dollars tuition to learn about FAGA, AGA, DNA, and alpha appliance because those are the stuff they taught them. The stuff they're not taught them, they're afraid to use because in general, they're lacking the knowledge of orthodontic treatment, the orthodontic movement. So their vision become limited that I can only do this because I know this is what I know. This is what I thought. The other stuff I wasn't told on, so I'm afraid to use it. Okay. Now, I know plenty of general dentists use MSC, okay? And they are ha happen to be excellent, excellent orthodontists as a general dentist, okay? I saw, I know quite a few of them. Their work is better than orthodontists I know. 
Okay. You have you know, dentists like those will use the MSC. So I guess it depends on your training. If something that you don't know, you reject. If you don't, if you lack the knowledge to identify the good and bad, then you're afraid to approach the situation. So they approach what they know. Now, currently in my office, I have four patients being treated for aftermath of the uh, agar and, and DNA appliance. And a lot of correction to be done. I have four in consultation, more in the, in the future coming up of those appliance mishaps. Happened with the bone loss, um, a tooth being pushed out of, of yellow bone, and root resorption, all those severe consequences like yourself. Okay, so I see, all I see is those patients, the mess up patient from those appliances. And I see they don't market to us. And I see the potential effect of the teeth. When I look at those, at their tooth moving appliance, they are not, in my opinion, as an orthodontist, as any orthodontist in the world would say they are growth appliance. Okay. Because growth doesn't come that easy. There's limitations. If there's no suture split, likely there will be no growth will happen in the mature bone. So without having experience, but only experience the best stuff, those appliance give me a lot of worry. Okay. Yeah. Give me a lot of worry. And, and <clears throat> if one day those appliance get legitimized by an ortho program, go through a through and through research, not some private research, but a proper authentic school research. And on all different aspects, like an MSC being researched back and forth so many times on all different aspects, then the orthodontist's point of view to those clients may be different. Yeah. Okay. One can argue that, or I, because I only see the bad one, the good one didn't see it, which is, could be absolutely true. Okay. But there's still the red flag of only the general dentist does them, not the orthodontist do them. Yeah. We're, we're the specialty of moving teeth. Yeah. And there's, there's also the red flag that it's being advertised as something that works in one way, but the reality is that it's working in another way. So even if there are good results somewhere, sometimes, even if many or most of the results are good, it's still wrong that that appliance is being sold uh, with a package of lies. Or, or at the, or you know, for me to be more generous, you could say ignorance. Maybe I shouldn't say lies, but a lot of ignorance. They're, they're, the patients are being told that their maxilla is growing forward, but that's just not what's happening. So, um, there's a lot of red flags with these treatments, mm -hmm. and um, I've been telling people for months, uh, actually for for well over a year now. Be careful. Be careful, and there's better options. Um, and I've spoken with so many people now who have been harmed. And for me, it's very close to home because I was harmed. And, and now it's costing me, I've had permanent damage to my mouth, and it's also costing me a lot of money to fix it. And I know that other people are in the same boat as me. So I do like to take every chance I get to at least caution patients to mm -hmm. be careful of, with especially the FAGA, AGA appliance. Um, uh, uh, another, another thing I want to add to it is the financial factor. Many of those patients who show up with the AGA failure, when they show me the treatment, they also show me the fee on those appliance. Okay. The appliance of those fees are simply ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I know. Fifteen um, to $20,000. Yes, that's more than enough to go through a legitimate MSC treatment, more than enough with the surgical assist and everything included. And, and one of the patient fee, I, I show my oral surgeon, my oral surgeon jaw drops and say, wow, that's more than a fee of surgery and MMA surgery plus your ortho treatment. Yeah. that have been provided to, to 
a general dentist providing agar and DNA treatment. That's how, in our eyes, it's as, as, as eye-opening, jaw-dropping. See, how could someone legitimize charging patient so much more than, than a legitimate way to do this kind of treatment, which is MSC, MNA, uh, and, or MA surgery combined together and cost more than that. So opinions are very, very important, okay? Don't, don't just simply buy into that, okay? If you, if you even, even if, say, those appliances, we even assume that you're gonna get an excellent, excellent equal result as MSC with a MNA or it's just MSC treatment. You still pay a lot more. You still pay a lot more, and and it's still done by a, a, a not an orthodontist. But you you get you get your work done by not a specialist, but it's a lot higher than what you will pay to a specialist. Yeah, yeah, I see the cost Which thing. Which is the financial point that I disagree on. Assuming you get the same result, you still paying quite a lot more. Yeah. We're not talking about 10%, 20%, we're talking about three times more. Okay. Yeah. Two, yeah. three times more. Yeah. That's and, how they're, and they're not getting the same result. Of course, not only are, are many of them getting damaged, but there's been a lot of surveys done recently. How many aga patients are experiencing an improvement of nasal breathing? And the answer is almost universally, not me, no change in my nasal breathing. Once in a blue moon, you get someone comment, oh yeah, my nasal breathing improved significantly with AGA. Mine didn't. Um, so, I mean, at least with, with MSC, at the least, you're guaranteed an improvement in nasal breathing, essentially. Um, so they're not, getting, they're not getting the same results. And uh, I'll comment a little bit on the cost thing. And this is my own opinion. You don't have to... Um, you know, support this. I think that the reason that these AGA providers are charging 15,000, 20,000 for this treatment is because it, it's a, it could be a few things. The first is more cynical. I think that they know this is a short lived phenomenon. I think they, they know that within two to five years, this is going to be gone because the internet is going to expose it. The internet is going to continue to shed light on it through open sharing of information. People like me and others, such as those in the, uh, the Facebook group that's dedicated to failed AGA cases. There's now a whole Facebook group with close to, you know, 80 members, all failed AGA cases who are talking about their experience. Um, th 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 this is a bubble that's going to burst. And I think they're getting while the getting's good, so to speak. I think they're trying to rake it in and just trying to, you know, get as much as they can while they can, because this is going to be exposed eventually. But the second reason I think they're charging so much is because I believe that this treatment is being marketed to a very specific type of patient. I believe that AGA is being marketed to the type, it's a kind of pseudo spiritual orthodontics, you could say. This is it's being advertised as like the whole foods version of orthodontics. It's organic, it's natural, it's biologically in sync. You're pressing a button and your body is so wise that it knows how to grow if you just press in the perfect spot. And I look, I am a, uh, uh, someone who loves natural medicine and who loves natural living. And I am intrigued by this idea that the body has a growth button that when you press it, the mouth goes, it's a beautiful idea. And people like me are willing to pay a premium for the organic product. It's like paying double for organic anything, right? This is the organic orthodontic appliance and you pay a premium for it. And in fact, if, if it were any less than $15,000, then it would be suspicious because something so brilliant Something so magical and innovative must be expensive. So, all right, doctor. Well, look, I, I know we're running out of time here. I wanted to, do we have time for two more questions? Sure. Um, 
two things. I want to talk about forward expansion without surgery, and I want to talk about surgical assist MSE briefly, because I think we're going to do a whole separate discussion of that mm -hmm. later, maybe with Dr. Vaughn. Yes. Tell me, for a patient who thinks, okay, I need not just lateral expansion, but I need forward expansion. And that's why I want to do AGA because I want forward expansion. Or I, that's why I think I need surgery because MSC isn't going to expand me forward. What orthodontic tools do you have to give some forward expansion? And specifically, I'd like you to talk about whether or not you, um, how you feel about the SFOT for forward expansion, SFOT and Invisalign. Okay. Um, as an option. No. no, this is what's going on. The four expansion by simply expand with MNC, you get a minor forward movement according to research. I think it's under one millimeter. Okay. In my opinion, probably half a millimeter, slight forward movement. Okay. You do get your mid face enhancement. Okay. So if it's appearance wise, uh, this forward movement sometimes is not necessary just after the MSC. Okay. Now, the forward movement usually what we do is by using reversible headgear, or people sometimes call it face mask, which is, I think, sounds kind of ugly. <laughs> okay. The reversible headgear, this term I like to use, is the one, the legitimate device that can actually pull your um, arm forward. But <clears throat> there's a couple restrictions. Those de devices work really well when patients are young, like a teenager or preteen or simply a kid. Okay, those work really well. Okay, now when you go into adult, it goes into a gray area with face mask. We're talking about face, yes, yeah, yes, with a face mask. We're talking about an adult, adult. I think Dr. Moon commented before for kids, you can go up to six, seven millimeter four movement for adult. The max is three. Okay. So if you're a male, I will say if you get two, you're lucky. And this would be like how many months, how many hours per day to get three now, millimeters? I recommend at least 14 hours. At least 14 hours. Okay. At least 14 hours a day. That's my recommendation. Um, for example, right now there's COVID going on, COVID 19 going on 24 7. Okay. Now the face, the face mask only work right after the expansion because the, the the theory behind it is once you expand it all your suture become slightly loose then you'll be able to drag the maxilla forward slightly now if you if you don't drag at a proper time the first one then you put the potential of you moving the maxilla all of a sudden cut more than half the second month it just you see what you can do the third month, fourth month, forget about it. It's not going to happen. Wow. Okay. So if you don't get that, then you lose a chance. So I always emphasize the patient, you want to avoid surgery, you want to try to work. The first month is very important. If you miss the window, you miss the window. That's really interesting. So the window starts when you stop expanding or it starts when you split the suture? Your bones start, start fusing again then that means you stop expanding. Then you, the suture will start fusing together. Then your chance of pulling forward is much less. So let's say you wanted 50 turns for a patient. Mm -hmm. You would start the reverse pull headgear after the 50th turn or you would start it? No, I would start during. You would start as soon as you see a diastema? Yes. And then you would continue for maybe one or two months after you stop yeah. turning? No. One technique that I use is for patients who are slacking out the headgear, then I will intentionally overexpand them, have them continue wear headgear for another month or two. Okay. And then I can back turn and make it go back in a little bit. You turn it backwards, actually. Turn it backward. Yes. Wow. That's clever. To, to, to decrease it. Or I can decrease it first and then increase it to play around with the suture. Hopefully that will help. But honestly, for those patients who doesn't use headgear the first two months, chance of them using it again are very rare. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So for those patients, I just be frank with them saying, hey, you don't use it, the tumor will fail. Tumor will fail, we have to go to plan B or plan C, okay? Plan C will be surgery, plan B is I can maybe do some other stuff to the face to camouflage the look, but you're not gonna get an ideal result, okay? Yeah, so the long and the short That's of it is, you don't, you don't, like to move teeth forward. Um, it, there's not a there's not a great orthodontic option for moving teeth several millimeters forward. Moving teeth forward, if if I look at your cephalometric X-ray, if your teeth are relatively straight, not proclined, because proper teeth have to have a proclination angle, then I will consider moving your teeth forward. Okay, if you can tolerate it, then yes. Okay, to make it a growth. There's not a growth. You're basically just tipping your teeth outward. Right. Okay. Right. There's no growth about it. Mm -hmm. So for the severe cases of someone who really wants to come forward more, let's say they have a side profile and they it's it's too recessed and they want to come forward. In in a lot of cases, if they're not willing to do the face mask, uh, there are other things I can do. For example, if the face is not too long. Yeah. So normal size face or a little square jaw, we can actually make the lower jaw rotate backward a little bit by increasing the facial height. So the jaw will, will clockwise rotate. So when the jaw clock, clockwise rotate, it will create an over jaw and then we start sinking the bite in. Those are another trick I can use to correct some minor difference. I see. And do you have any thoughts on uh, surgically facilitated orthodontic therapy or wilcodontics? This idea of putting down new bone with corticotomies through a bone graft and then no. expanding forward? I think those ideas are very popular pre-MSC. Okay. Pre-MSC, those ideas are very popular because they want to make the jaw, upper jaw wider. But again, you are actually moving your teeth into new bone. Yeah not really genuinely correct the structure or the function of the nasal cavity, okay? Now, right now, the only condition I will use is with the lower, okay? If the lower jaw is truly small or patient have a lot of recession going on already, okay? Then to upright those teeth might cause the recession worse. Then those are the patient I will legitimately concern to put the S do the SLOT. So that, so we, at the same time, we help to correct those um, recession issue at the same time. I see. Okay. So we don't worry about operating to lose, operating losing more, more uh, gum structure. Okay. I see. Now top one, it really doesn't have to because the MS, MSC. Now the other reason we consider FSOT is patient have a timeline to meet. They're getting married. They have to have braces out before a certain time, then that's another one to make it go faster. Right, right. So for the severe, severely recessed cases, this, the only, the real good way to get significant forward movement is through, still through surgery, you would say. There's yes. no MSE equivalent for forward no. expansion. Not yet. Yeah. Well, hey, maybe you'll uh, save the day, Dr. Ting. We'll have to, we'll uh, get team you up with an engineer and, uh, and a venture capitalist and we'll get this thing going. <laughs> so, all right, Dr. Ting, last thing I wanted to pick your brain about for now. You mentioned several times in this interview already, surgical assist MSE. Um, I know that one of the big risks with MSE is failure to split. I've spoken with several people who have had MSEs installed, but they got no split. Then they had to have the MSE removed and a second one put in, or they just gave up. I even talked to a guy once who had two MSEs in at the same time. I, I, never, I didn't see a photo of it, but he told me that his orthodontist, a naval, uh, a naval orthodontist, had two MSEs in at the same time, and he didn't get a split. So tell us about surgical installation of MSE. When is it appropriate? Does it solve the problem of failure to split? What other problems does it solve? How much does it cost? Uh, who's a candidate for it? Um, the floor is yours. Okay. 
So the surgical assist MSC is, I think, it's one of the great thing happened to MSC. After the MSC happened, this is the great thing because we now routinely know that for females, no matter how old you are, we can split you. Okay. The worst scenario it would do quarter puncture. Quarter puncture meaning that we use a tiny little drill, drill along the mid pal to switch her. My guideline, yes, exactly. My guideline is I usually drill between 15 to 20 holes in between. Right that down this line from, from here to here, 15 yeah. holes with uh, your dental 15 drill. 15 to 25 holes. Okay. For, for male, I also do and from the front, between the front roots. Now, those usually solve the problem for female. Okay. Now, for male, it's a completely different story. For male, my, my youngest patient that failed to expand without quarter puncture is 20 years old. So my, my protocol is if you're 20 and older as your male, I do quarter puncture. Okay. Now, after quarter puncture, the oldest success patient I have is 48 years old. Okay. The youngest patient that failed quarter puncture is 27. I actually have 127 and 129 years old fail to expand after extensive quarter puncture. Okay. So those patients, so male, it's unknown. So send them what are called the surgical assist. So surgical assist, what my surgeon will do. It's a very surgeon specific. What he does is he do three splits for me. Okay. The number one would put it MSC in first. Okay. And then you put the MSC in. We put the MSC in. Okay. And then what a surgeon would do is an in office procedure. So it's not in the hospital. That's significantly lower the cost of the procedure. As you do a split between from here, you crack the mid part of the Okay. The two other split is what they do, what they call the um, uh, nasal maxillo buttress right here. If you have a skull, you can lift up and take a look. It's from the corner of the nose to the cheekbone right here. Sometimes you may extend it here. Now, extend it all the way back toward the molars? Not all the way to the back, halfway possible. Okay. But those details, when you have an interview, when you have a chance of interviewing Dr. Vong, he will go over details because I'm not a surgeon. So I'm just translating what he told me. But the, the cut right here is not through and through cut. It's actually just superficial on the outside quarter bone layer. So the inside is all intact. So what he does is because this curvature right here, this buttress right here, create a lot of pressure preventing your Max, uh, maxilla from expanding this way. So this too, on the outside, the curved part, he cut this. Inside's intact. So all of a sudden, your bone become flexible like your teenager again. Okay. So you still get your cheekbone changes a little bit. You still get your um, increase in nasal volume because your whole maxilla is flexing. Mm -hmm. The procedure is simply make your maxilla flexible instead of stiff, not flexible. So let me get this straight. So you're saying that primarily what Dr. Vaughn would do is he would chisel right down this center mm -hmm. line between the roots of the front two teeth and he mm -hmm. would split right there, right? Yes. So he would not cut here. The split would be from the front. And then all the way down but the split continues through. Yes. It's like splitting a log. Yes. Where you split it at uh -huh. one point, but it splits through and through to the bottom. Yes. And now you're also saying in conjunction with that, in many cases, he cuts the top layer mm -hmm. of bone in this mm -hmm. area from the corner of the nose down into this area. And mm -hmm. you're saying there's multiple layers of bone here and he only cuts Usually one layer? Have a two cortical layer of bone, which is a thick side of bone. Outside, inside, insert, in, inner bone is more hollow, less dense, it's called a cancellous bone. So he cut the outside, the big, thick one that's curved around. 
prevent your maxilla from flexing. Right. So, so the hard one, the inside one's intact. So when you expand, the inside bone will flex with it. I see. So okay. for for a comparison with with double jaw surgery, they would cut it all the way Completely through, through and through. So you like a denture. Every layer, and then this piece detaches like a denture. Yeah. That's but why with, you don't get the proper airway enhancement. Because this, because uh, the suture never splits. It just comes off intact as a denture. This piece stays yes. the same width. Yes, they could also split it, but in the same time, you don't get the flex of the uh, nasal cavity. I see, I now, see. The way he does it is once he creates split, he will start turning the MSC. Because it's already in. You put the MSC in before the surgery. Yes. So he will make sure you get a small diastema when you're leaving his office. If when he turn your MSC, he didn't see a split, he will continue to create more farther back cut until you get a small diastema. Then he called it quit. I see. So, so you're before you leave the office, you will already get a legitimate diastema. Wow. Guaranteed split. Guaranteed split. Now, in my office, my MSC failure rate is 1%. Versus some other office, majority of them fail because you have to have the various different protocol on how to treat patients. Remember again, I say MSC is just a tool. Just because you have the tool to fix European car doesn't mean that you know how to fix European car. Correct. That's a I have the tools, but I don't know how to fix them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so my protocol is you have to have proper guidelines for every gender and age. When that fails, second layer goes in. Well, option B failed, the quarter puncture failed, the third one goes in, okay. Or I also have a policy, a, a protocol of, if you're coming extremely narrow, then I will send you directly to surgical assist. Why do I do that? It's because if you're extremely narrow to start with, I can't afford to have you tip your TAD by yanking and cranking it and lose another two millimeter here, two millimeter there, just by losing those cement. Now, most of my patients with the surgical assist, their TAD are pretty straight because the splits are easy. They're like a young kid. Of course. They're, they're the bone of a young kid. So a split very easy, so TAD stays straight, okay? So if you come in with super narrow jaw, I need all eight or 10 millimeter expansion I can get okay, then I will send you to, pro to surgery. Because you can't afford to lose any of that eight millimeters to distortion resulting from resistance. Exactly. I understand. And um, all that you've just said, we have to now talk about something else, and that is pain associated with MSE. I know I said that was my last question before, but this is, a this is a really big one because most of what people know about MSC pain comes from what I've said about it, which is on the extreme. I had a lot of pain when I had my cortical puncture and when I was turning several turns a day initially to split the suture, I had a lot of pain and I was very public about how painful it was. Probably when people are hearing you say about the doctor chiseling through the suture and then cutting this bone, they're thinking, oh my gosh, that's insane. I'd rather keep my small airway and my small face than go through all that. What do your patients tell you about what it's like to do a surgical assist with Dr. Vaughn and or, or even just a cortical puncture with you or even just an MSE install, the four TADs? Excellent. So let's talk about, let's do step by step. Okay. First, let's talk about um, the uh, MSC alone. Now, MSC alone, the insertion process is very, very important. Okay. Now, if this adult patient does not have anything else, just do MSC alone. If you talk to a, a grown adult person, most of them will tell you they don't have a lot of pain they have some minor discomfort that Tylenol can take care of it. 
sometimes they didn't take Motrin. Okay, now that's what a responsible adult usually give answer to us. When you ask teenager, it's a complete different story. Teenager are different animals. Teenager will make the parents call us. I have excruciating pain. I have this. I have that. I'm dying. But does teenager blame the parents for making them have MSC? That's in my personal opinion. I never have a grown responsible adult ever tell me that I'm dying with the MSC. Okay. I have one or maybe two ladies calling us. I have pain. What should I do? I have this. What should I do? But after they calm down two weeks later, three weeks when I do my check, they will say, yeah, pain was a little bit intense only the first day. And afterwards, actually painkiller took care of it. Okay. I think more worry for adults, more of a worry. They feel something funny. There's something I need to worry about. Then a physical pain in my office. For teenager, you can trust them because they blame parents for everything. They want the parents to feel bad. On young kids, however, they have no pain. I have young kids that didn't take painkillers. I have a lot of testimonial on my YouTube video. If you search my office website or link to my, U, uh, my office YouTube channel, their kids talk about they have no pain. Okay. Why is uh, my MSC experience so much different than your MSC experience? There's one simple fact. I do not do fast turn protocol. Okay. My protocol is either don't turn the first day or if you have to, okay, then we do one turn a day. Okay. One turn a day simply solve a lot of those severe pain issues that you associate with it. TV, dragging in your bone, tipping the thing and stretching the tissue and feel like your skull gonna split. Basically, take care of all those problems. And so, also, I'm sorry, Dr. Know. Ting. So, mm -hmm. when you say one turn a day, you're saying that you instruct your patients to turn their, because of course, the MSE is an appliance that the patient turns. The patient has a key, the MSE has a little hex screw, and the, the, the patient turns it him or herself. Mm -hmm. You instruct the patient to turn one turn per day. One turn a day. Until finished. From start to end, one turn per day. Yes. Now, I also instruct patient when you hit resistance, when you have a hard time turning, don't turn. Wait for a few days. Wait one day, two days, three days, no matter what. Okay. Until it's easy to turn again. Okay. Because the bone needs some time to remodel and split. If you force it, guess what will happen? you increase a lot of pain unnecessarily. At the same time, you're actually tipping the MAC screw. If the bone's not gonna give, what's gonna give? The MSC. The MSC. The, so the TAD start bending, okay. One of my, and the reason, one of my reason my MSC's failure rate is only 1%. That's all my failure I have is follow the one moon fast <laughs> protocol, okay. Again, I did that. That's what I did. And it was painful. Again, it's all hell. It's an orthodontic genius. Okay. Fasting protocol totally worked for MAC1. But MAC2 is a complete different animal. But he followed the same protocol. From my experience, once you start doing the fast turning, force turning, the first thing you do is your MAC will start bending. Now you have tons of space waste. Okay. Because your screw tip, so... Now you lost two millimeter here, lost two millimeter there. You have four millimeter expansion potential completely wasted, or maybe even six. Okay. Secondly, is once you bend the whole MSC, start warping. Okay. Once they warp, okay. Think about this way: this is the MSC, then that's the arms. Okay. And once the MSC start warping, the arms start sticking outward, digging to palate. At the same time, push your molar out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pains from molar being bending outward. Oh, wow. That sounds okay. dangerous, actually. So it is. It causes uh, bone dehesions, and then that's why a lot of problem happens. So 
if you use slow turning protocol, all those will be prevented. You don't have to turn that fast. Why? Because my success, prove it, fast turning protocol is not necessary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All my failed patients from those protocols, at the same time, at the same time, you have um, flexing of the of the uh, uh, the MSC, so the arm starts sticking sideways and start flexing out the molar. You have so much molar pain. My wife had a, my wife is one of the failed cases. She's one of the early on uh, uh, MSC two cases I have. Her case totally failed because the whole thing just warped up. Molar get tipping outward. She has severe pain in the molar every single day. She's she's like you, miserable. Yeah. Okay. That's when I decided there are something wrong with this turning protocol that does not work. Until the end, when the warp so much, you can't even turn the screws anymore, or the screw will break apart. Okay. I I had I had a lot of those issues in my own MSE case. I did. It's all got to do with a fast turning protocol. If you follow a protocol. Major, not majority, a large percentage of the case will fail. Yeah. That's why I started a lot of experienced MSC user start using the slow turning protocol. And, and you know, the reason I remember specifically why I was allured by the fast turning protocol, because I had this idea that until I split, so first of all, there was anxiety. Is the suture going to split? Ah, is it going to split? I wonder, am I going to be one of the lucky ones who it splits? And so I was anxious. So I wanted to turn, turn, turn to get the split. Secondly, I had this idea, once it splits, the pressure is going to stop. And I'm going to have this release once the suture lets go. And so again, I felt, well, maybe I can just get there faster. And so these were the ideas that led me to want to turn, turn, turn. And so again, this is why I like the surgical install is because you don't have to have anxiety about the split anymore. You can just do the right thing, go nice and slow, and not have to feel like you have to sprint toward the split. Okay. So that's for normal MSC patient without any procedure. This is how I prevent from severe pain. Secondly, it's got to do with the quarter puncture. Quarter puncture procedure, there's so many different ways to, to do it. Okay, so in general, I think I set a standard of doing it. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Wong Moon suggests to use the TAD to do f six to seven holes, turn in, turn out, turn in, turn out. Now, anyone who have TAD put in before, when I first heard that protocol, I just think, how realistic is that? First of all, TAD gets dull. After two or three times, you gotta throw away the TAD, get another TAD. Secondly, TAD is a loose, loose screw. So if when you do four to six to seven of them in and turn out, first of all, they leave bigger holes. Secondly, is you have so much high chances of dropping the screw in patient's throat. Okay, that's a really unrealistic procedure that expect to be you, some patient. Time out, Dr. Jing. You're talking about do, doing a cortical puncture with a pad screw, which yes. basically it's like you're screwing into wood. You put the screw in and then you put the drill on reverse and you pull it out. And yeah. that, that hole is instead of a dental drill, you're putting yeah. the tad in and out. Exactly. And so it's a very time consuming not realistic and dangerous process. And you're only putting six, seven holes. So my, my uh, protocol on the quarter puncher is I get a super slow speed drill, okay? And <clears throat> a very skinny drill, probably only half the diameter of the, of, of the uh, MSC or maybe less, okay? I go in completely through and through until I hit less resistance out, in and out, completely, about one to half millimeter apart on every single- on, uh, One single. millimeter apart? Yes. Half That's very, very apart. close together. Very close together, okay. 
but it's a much smaller, finer drill with a much slower speed, so we have less bone damage. Okay, hardly any bleeding, and then we'll go in and out, in and out, and through and through. Okay, that means I drill it until I hit less resistance. So what are you going through there? You're going through multiple layers of bone and you know exactly yes. what you're trying to do? Uh-huh. Going through a second cortical layer of bone. So I found out that technique is much useful because the drill is attached to a slow speed. Not slow speed hand piece. It's a slower speed hand piece. The same speed as putting the dental implant. Those kind of... You know. So we'll go in and out, in and out, in and out. Those will minimize the wound maximize chances because we extend it all the way okay very little bleeding and basically very safe procedure without worrying about anything dropping patient's throat now there are some other doctor out there like to use high speed high speed is actually in my opinion quite dangerous high speed drill the drill t they go in like this okay first of all they just touch the superficial bone it's not going to work that way so they do a little bit a little bit a little bit a little bit at the same time, they um, <clears throat> um, don't go through both layer bones, okay? And then you don't have, because all the spray, the water, the bleeds, and then the, the high speed tend to burn the bone around the area. So it will interfere with bone healing, okay? That's another way I think is not a good way to do, okay? Now, or, or like, um, you say, Dr. New was there for you, they fan out a little bit. I think it's a little bit excessive. It worked, obviously, but I think the excessiveness of those processes also increased the pain. I had a lot of pain after my uh, cortical, uh, cortical puncture, a lot. So the cortical puncture would do is, the minute I stopped drilling, your bleeding basically stopped. Okay. The, the bleeding, I... I love to show patients how much bleeding they have on a piece of gauze. I say, this is less than the last bleeding than the last pimple that you pop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's how I go in and out. So healing is super fast. The next day, they're healed. They say the holes are gone next week because we use a very, very tiny drill to drill between all the lines. So that's how I enhance my quarter puncture. I think I have the record of the oldest male being expanded with quarter puncture. The oldest male they expanded is 48 years old. Wow. I don't think anyone has anyone with a simple quarter puncture be able to expand a male patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, good, good for you. 46 and, and then also 45 year old being expanded. Mm -hmm. So that's excellent result. And then with the minimum discomfort. Okay. Sure. Now surgical assist, according to my patient, I have patient that took one day off. Well, after the surgery, took one day off. The day after, he went back to work. Okay. So they say they need to be on painkiller for two days. Okay. One patient say he was on painkiller for three days. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. okay. So similar to like maybe wisdom teeth extraction. Exactly. That's what they say. No worse than wisdom tooth extractions. Mm -hmm. And so tell me about... Actually, it's two weeks after. That's when all the inflammation will go away. So the the, the inflammation peaks sooner with a surgical install than with inflammation probably peak the next the second day. Okay. And tell me about the sedation with surgical install. Is it a local anesthetic or is it? It's so not it's general like, anesthesia. Okay. Not general. It's not in the office, so it's not general. Mm -hmm. it's, off. it's same as the taking out with them too. Okay. Okay. It's in office sedation. Okay, so you're definitely so you're awake, but what's it like? You're awake, but but you're loopy, or or are you asleep, or what? You are. You're not awake. You're semi awake. Okay. Some people, I would say, some people are, res are responsive. Is it like laughing gas, where you come out of it and you're you say funny things? It's not laughing gas. It's a it's a it's a it's a sedation. It's an injection through your through your vein. Okay, but it's not painful. It's not like you're feel. It's not like uh, you're go. You're you're watching the dentist, you know, chisel no. through your jaw. No, okay. no. Uh, so uh, if anybody have anybody have wisdom to the extraction, they can sense that. Yeah, 
I yeah, I'm I, I did mine a long time ago. I don't remember being awake for the procedure, but I also remember that I wasn't put to sleep either. Um, it wasn't bad. I remember going to school the next day um, mm -hmm. after my wisdom teeth were out. So, so that doesn't sound too bad. And how much cost roughly, you know, plus or minus one or $2,000 does, does a surgical in I would say around $2,000 range, a little bit higher. That's what I, what I was told my patient. Okay. okay. So it depends on different cases, I guess. Okay, so you can expect that if you want to do a surgical install to pay maybe two to three thousand more. Yes. I would say that would sound reasonable. On top of your MSE orthodontist bill. Yes. Now, I have a patient, uh, a virtual consultation patient. They say they got called for a surgical assist by an oral surgeon for $20,000 or $12,000. I forgot. And that's definitely not a legitimate number. If you see a number like that, that means the surgeon probably had never done it before. They just guess they may give you a number in case. Yeah, so this is an, because anytime you involve an orthognathic surgeon, it's scary because now you're, that, the, 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 the cost of dealing with an oral surgeon is an order of magnitude more than dealing with any other type of dentist usually. Mm -hmm. But you're saying you work with a guy, Dr. Vaughn, who you have a relationship with, he does this routinely, he has a more or less a fixed price that's very reasonable. Um, that's so important to, to, to have a team like that who work together. And talk about reasonable, it's way more reasonable than agon and DNA. <laughs> oh my gosh, stop it. <laughs> Don't get me going again on that, please. I was just starting to calm down. <laughs> way more reasonable than that. Well, I mean, look, how much, I, I've been saying recently, AGA is a really expensive extraction procedure. I was saying if you want to if you want to pull teeth, you can do it for a lot less than fifteen thousand dollars. Maybe that's too harsh. But, but that's not the end of the AGA because you're gonna need four implants afterwards. Then you're gonna need four implants. I know. That's twelve thousand dollar additional to it. It's so sad, Doctor Ting, and I hate to oh, beat a dead horse. Addition to it. <laughs> like... How much? $16,000 vision. Uh, what, like 4,000 a piece, 4,000 an implant? Uh -huh. And this, this, is the, this is the terrifying thing. I know someone, um, a woman who has a failed AGA case. She had so much bone loss around her front teeth that they're not even sure that they're going to be able to put implants. She has to have extractions, but they're not even sure they're going to be able to put implants after that's how severe the damage is. So uh, it's serious stuff, Dr. Ting. Um, but anyway, so um, do we have time for one more question? Sure. Tell me, about, tell me about asymmetry. I think my, contact, my content has created a lot of anxiety in MSE, people interested in MSE. It's created anxiety that, oh, my existing asymmetry is gonna get worse or I'm going to have an asymmetric expansion. One side is going to push more than the other. Do you think, what do you, what would you say to patients who are worried about asymmetry? Okay. Let's first clarify asymmetry. From my experience of practice, asymmetry are mostly caused by occlusal can't. Okay. I yesterday actually saw a patient, the whole maxilla actually one side more than the other. But that's the only patient I ever see. All the asymmetry I see happen because there's a occlusal can't. When there's a occlusal can't, your lower jaw follows. That's how most asymmetry happens. Okay. So asymmetry is not really a, a symmetry of the left and right. It's more of a can't that will happen. Now, when that can't happen, we expand you as normal. Because if your jaw is this way, we do have to put the uh, <clears throat> MNC parallel to the jaw, okay? So those corrections are pretty easy. Once so I expand you, because we can't put one MNC longer than the other, it had to be parallel to the floor to get expansion. After expand that, we can simply intrude this side or let this side erupt more, depends on your height of the face, then we can correct symmetry. Now for adult, the jaw, return or back, we don't know. 
because it depends on your jaw is it even length or not even length. If you had it for a long time, chances are your jaw one length, one's longer than the other. Okay, then you might get a 50% correction. Okay, everybody gets some kind of correction. Okay, if you're a younger kid, teenager, chances are you get 100% return. Time out. So you're saying that um, a patient might present with what appears to be an asymmetry in the maxilla, but really it's just a cant. You correct that cant ortho orthodontically yes. by using TADS to intrude the lower side, to pull those teeth in, to flatten. Yes. And this results in the lower jaw correcting itself simply by repositioning. Yes. In, in accordance with the corrected maxilla. Yes, unless if your jaw already grown this way, one longer than the other. For example, in a 45-year-old male who's had this cant for 30 years, maybe now he has a permanent bone change in his lower jaw that makes it impossible to, for the lower jaw to correct. Yeah. But for those patients, I usually expect maybe a 50% correction. Uh, you expect some correction, but not oh, 100%. Correct. And then um, how, do you, how do you finish that off? So we just leave it the way it is. I see. Unless a patient has a severe TMJ problem, because usually a shorter size is the size of the problem, okay? Then you might consider a surgical procedure to correct it. Okay. Some, some kind of mandibular surgery? Yes, to correct it. Or if patient is going to have MMA to, to start with, then you might not want to correct it, just let the surgeon correct it. I see. At the same time. Okay. I see. So it depends. But my surgeon, he always want me to correct as much as I can before the surgery. Because surgery correction, there's always side effects. Okay. So if I can correct anything orthodontically, he always encouraged me to correct them. First, even less work to do. I understand. What do you say to people, though, who say that you're taking... That, that the cant or the asymmetry is actually in the, in the uh, basal bone and that you're just putting a Band-Aid over it by moving the teeth to try to correct the asymmetry? That's a very good question. When we're moving the, when we're moving the, the teeth, okay, we're actually moving the whole section from canine to second molar. That's five teeth, okay completely together with the bone up. Now, a common, a common fact is when you first do the intrusion, your gum will swell up around the area. So vigorous brushing is very important. So once the inflammation go away, the bone will remodel, the whole section of bone actually will remodel back in, okay? When we finish the treatment, when we finish, the teeth look normal, the bone level is actually normal. Oh. Interesting. So when you intrude teeth, people think of that as only the teeth are changing. But of course, for teeth to be intruded, the bone has to change. Yes, the bone has to change. And one thing you can tell if you have a closed can or not is when you look at, take a picture up front. If you see your lips one higher than the other, okay, from the eye, from the pupil to the eye to the corner of the lips, then you have a can. Yeah, for example, if people look at me right now, there's, and my lips are closed, you might see this side is a little lower, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this would indicate that I have a cant like this. Yes. So if I were to your case, I would just expand normally and then correct the cant later on. So based on the way I look with my mouth shut, you would intrude the teeth on this side. You would yeah. pull, pull these teeth up like this. Exactly. And then my lower jaw would follow. Hopefully. Hopefully will follow. Hmm. Hmm. At your age, you'll probably expect 50 to 75% correction. I'm 30 years old, just so the audience knows. Yeah, so I'm getting into that range where I'm starting to stiffen up. Exactly, exactly. Now, the real asymmetry is very rarely seen. Okay. Now, another question is, patients sometimes call me, I think I have um, asymmetric expansion. Asymmetric expansion, to me, I never see one legitimate one after 300 cases. I never see one, okay? <clears throat> because sometimes when you have a can, 
when you expend more, one side will look like you get more, but it's not. A patient start paying more attention at the teeth. They start thinking more, but it's not because every force is a reaction force. Unless we do, do say, for example, we do surgical assist on one side only. Okay, if you have, for example, a true shift maxilla, every level of the maxilla shift, okay? I haven't had one patient, I just saw one yesterday. But if I would approach the case, I would probably say, let's put the MSC in, have the surgeon do surgical assist on this side, then we can probably expand this side a little more. Wow, that's from, so you would actually be inter, you would actually experiment with that kind of uh, uh, novel treatment approach. Yes, surgical assist on do. one side. Yes, but that's much rarer. P probably when people watch my videos, they think asymmetry is very common. But what you're saying is true asymmetry. Asymmetry at the level of the bone it is really rarely happen. And in most cases, same thing as uh, let's go back to the topic about the lower jaw. We're talking about how to widen the lower jaw. Yeah, the true narrow lower jaw, I probably hardly ever see. Okay, I can think of maybe one patient. Those patients usually like this what we call a syndromic patient. Patient patient born with certain kind of syndrome, they have a not developed lower jaw. And most of the small narrow lower jaw problems not because it's not because the jaw is not wide enough. It's because jaw is receding. I see. And it's, it's almost always the case that the upper jaw, not when you look at the teeth, but when you look at the bone, is narrower than the lower jaw. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, in almost all cases after MSE expansion, you can match the lower with the upper simply by moving the teeth like we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Dr. Ting. Um, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I feel like I've created a lot of anxiety for people about asymmetry. I think that uh, you've given people comfort that a asymmetry MSE problems or what appears to be asymmetry MSE problems, really it's more um, tooth, tooth borne issues. Those can be corrected simply by moving teeth orthodontically, which you've probably done in dozens and dozens and dozens of cases. Yes. So great, that's great. Um, well, I think that's probably enough for now. We've been going for a while. We'll definitely have to split this up into smaller pieces. I think we've probably been going for well over an hour. Um, oh, yes. So yeah, well, we'll tr <laughs> two hours. We'll, we'll chop it up into bite-sized question and answers. And um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'm sure the audience is going to really appreciate all your insights. And we look forward to having Dr. Vaughn on at some point to discuss surgical assist. Um, and, and then I'll, I'm sure we're going to get some further questions that the audience is going to want to have answered. And maybe we'll have you on again to do a follow-up interview if you would be willing. 